success for better things. Can you hear me in the back? Is that okay, the voice, volume? Okay, thank you so much for inviting me here. Okay, so I have to agree, of course. Okay. All right, okay, thank you. Um, so the talk of my title is called The Human Side of AI. And uh, so let's envision together how the AI can help children with uh, uh, speech and the language related uh, uh, disabilities or the services. And uh, let me just here. Okay. So as uh, like Yandy mentioned, and uh, I will kind of walk you through a little bit of uh, the recent uh, the pro uh, projects we received from National Science Foundation on this uh, uh, National AI Institute for Exceptional Education. And um, here is the news. Actually, we got this uh, grant, which was a very happy uh, gift from the uh, from <laughs> And NSF at the beginning of the year, and we made an announcement. And this is a, our grant is a twenty million dollars from NSF and the IES, and for this established National AI Institute to advance the AI technology to help children with disabilities, and in particular, folks on the speech and the language related issues. And just show a quote from our president. And uh, when this news can get out, right? And this really shows, okay, uh, how our researchers can work together to provide a solution to address a society's most present challenges. And the reason for me to cite this quote, because of this is a try uh, kind of seminar, I know this is your try second, like, one of the missions too, how to use AI to solve societal uh, impactful challenges. And that's why I think it's a very kind of a fitting topics for, for this seminar. And since this news was announced, and of course, there's a lot of publicity for ourselves, for our work and for our actual planned work and for our institute. And we got the news coverage from by Forbes and actually all the NPRs as well. And there's a lot of interesting conversations going on and how we can use AI to help children with disabilities. And uh, of course, some of the um, acknowledgement first, you know, that is uh, required. And this is uh, the research is uh, funded by uh, both the NSF and the Institute of Education uh, Services. And it's a, and by the way, this is a kind of our institute logo and National AI Institute for Exceptional Education. And the logo shows, right, this is a kind of for uh, robot means kind of AI and uh, the face shows the kind of speech bubble Kind of that's how we meant for the speech and the languages and the two claws right handling this S and L it means speech and the language and the antenna shows the directional which means that you want to have the directional conversation to provide the individualized help for the for the children and this antenna also shows a symbol of a P so together speech and the language pathologist. So that's kind of our artistic design for this institute. Okay. And uh, these are all the partners, your institutes involved in this AI Institute. And uh, this project is led by the UB and University of Buffalo with another eight institutes and uh, including the Stanford University and the University of Washington, University of Nevada, Reno and the University of Oregon and University of Texas, El Paso, and Cornell University, and the UIUC, and the Penn State. So there's a total of nine universities uh, being part of this institute. And as I mentioned, some of uh, your faculty this morning, and not everyone knows this program, right? So this AI Institute is a National Science Foundation program. And they started this program about three years ago. And uh, every year they will send out corporate proposals and they will identify a number of themes and uh, you need to adjust. And uh, in the past three years, you know, we are the third cohort, like uh, in a sense, you know, the third year, and uh, we are the 19th uh, to join this, uh, this, co uh, this kind of the, this program. And, um, and you can see there's a different programs and every year about uh, five to six, uh, uh, institute get selected. 
And out of the whole nine teams right now, okay, about four folks on education related topics. Like the first one, like uh, AI allowing is Institute for Adult Learning, right? And the, the, of course, the fourth one is ours, AI for Exceptional Education. And uh, down the bottom, they have this uh, uh, Engage AI, and that's another institute that focused on the engaged learning. And uh, the third towards the, the bottom here, this is another institute for the student and the AI teaming. So as you can see, this is a very much a focus, right? Like you see, out of this 19, four institutes focus on the education-related topics. And uh, we are the only one focused on the, uh, the exceptional education. And uh, we are the first one in the New York State to receive this uh, grant to, uh, to establish the National AI Institute. It's about $20 million and for five years. Like, and the other topics, including like many other topics, including the food and the securities and the, and the cloud and edge AI, et cetera, okay? So that's kind of the, uh, the whole like uh, setup is called the, the AI Institute Virtual Organizations. So in a sense, you know, this becomes like a, a team or a small club and they help each other to learn from each other, you know, how to run these bigger programs and how to make sure the programs and uh, is productive. And uh, so it's kind of very useful setup. And um, so, and of course, we like to uh, collaborate with many other universities as, as well. And also, if you guys are interested to maybe respond next year's one, and uh, feel free to reach out. And I'm happy to share with some of our uh, lessons learned and through this process. Okay. And this is how this institute look like. And uh, you know, as I mentioned, we have nine universities, right? And that's how the geographically kind of uh, kind of placed in this uh, uh, United States, and uh, and where they come from. As you can see here, UB is the main lead, and uh, we have faculties uh, from pretty much coast to coast, right? And uh, in terms of uh, demographics, we have uh, uh, thirteen actually female faculty members out of the thirty-one faculty members. Okay, in this institute. And of course, we, we put a lot of emphasis on the um, kind of uh, diversity as well. And uh, the way we pick the team members, right, is not only based on the locations of various universities, it's really based on their expertise and how they can fit together to, to solve these challenges. And the team is a very uh, exceptional team and with a long list of uh, accolades with different kinds of uh, awards and honors. So it's a very strong team. And um, so we are really excited about these projects and hopefully we can make something uh, special very soon. But since this is a seminar about this, uh, it's a Chai seminar. So I really think of again, how about the human side of AI, right? And uh, I want to walk you through this uh, journey like I have been through. So why I picked this topic and some of you mentioned this uh, this morning as well. and. Uh, I would say it all began with a personal journey. And uh, for myself, as a, uh, Professor uh, Yan mentioned, you know, I joined UB actually only about one and a half years ago. I joined the UB in the middle of the pandemics, 2021. And uh, prior to the UB position, and uh, I was with IBM TJ Watson Research for more than 15 years. And I've worked on many, many aspects of the, of the kind of the research topics and uh, why I picked this topic, right? So when I was responding to the proposal, what's going, what's going on? It's not because I just suddenly picked this topic. And um, so I said, like, this really for myself in the career wise, okay, the research interest wise, there's a really a, a turning point. And I call it as happening in the 20, 2010. And uh, just kind of a question, you know, people here, anyone remembers anything happened in 2010? Anyone? You can check the chat GPT too. If you want to. <laughs> Anyone remembers? Uh, we don't, right? Because that's for something. If you didn't personal experience, you probably didn't. You 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 you, you, did, you didn't register much in your in kind of for your experience. And uh, even though some of the disaster happened, right, and some bigger crisis happened in the world, and this some of the notable crisis, yes. okay, and happening in twenty ten. And uh, the first one is the Haiti earthquake. I'm just listing a few, right? 
and that impacts uh, thousands of people's lives and uh, homes. And the second is the BP oil spills, right? And uh, takes the BP years to clean it up and uh, pay the huge fines for the pollution, right? The environmental impact. And the third one, I think some of you may remember now, <laughs> and the Icelandic uh, volcano, right? And that uh, impact many, many flights out of the Euro Europe, right? <laughs> and some people probably get stuck in Europe, Europe, European countries for many days, weeks, right? So this is some of the things happened. Of course, this is a bigger crisis. And uh, if you happen to be one of those uh, uh, travels, you maybe get the fact you maybe remember. But otherwise, you know, it's on the newspaper, right? And it happened, it happened. And uh, why I remember all of these events, because that's the same year, actually, I also did something which is also had a long impact on myself. That the same year, I volunteered to go to India and uh, for, for some volunteer work for about a month. And that's something I actually personally kind of was seen, right? That's kind of another set of a crisis happening in our society. And uh, in India, you know, I worked with uh, some nonprofit organization to help the youth, right? To learn the skills so they can basically kind of uh, support their families and support themselves and have this uh, sustainable life. And also to go to the local communities to, to recruit and uh, to convince the parents, right? The children needs the education and uh, needs to learn the skills. And so it's okay for the parents to let the children to go to explore their own life. And also see some of this uh, kind of uh, really a kind of bigger contrast, right? Why is the modern society versus the, uh, the people living in the poor conditions and uh, with the food, the water, right? And all the kind of a crisis. And this is all the pictures I took of myself, I see it, right? And the people I interacted with. And that's kind of the one personal crisis that like I can see happening in our society. Why that make a, such a huge impact on myself? And because of pretty much the home, right? At the same time, I work for IM and the teacher Watson. Around that same time, and the IBM launched this uh, big, big, uh, this, uh, I don't know, the competition. I don't know if uh, this is really, I would say this is the beginning of the new AI kind of the fever right now, right? And that is the February 16th, 2011, right? The moment I get back from, the, from this volunteer services, IBM launched this one. And uh, of course, IBM has been in make of this technology for a long time. It's an IBM Watson. And that's an AI technology system, right? That is able to compete two of the best champions in this uh, Jeopardy show. And two of the best uh, champions and in terms of this uh, uh, unstructured knowledge kind of a competition and uh, which shows how the AI can understand the natural languages and for very sophisticated questions. It's not a factorial kind of questions, right? Uh, able to reason and, uh, and uh, strategize, strategize and it's a competition, you know, when to bet and when to uh, buzz in for the competition and uh, the AI won the competition. And that really kind of opened up people's imaginations, you know, what AI can do, right? And that's a lot of companies are starting to reinvest into the AI. Prior to this time, I would say that AI was considered as a very uh, old topic or pretty much kind of AI like winter, right? And this is really the beginning of the AI, new spring of the AI at that moment. Of course, people probably also don't remember this much as well. How many of people still remember this, what IBM wasn't for this AI? Jeopardy. Okay, hand, handful of hands, right? That's kind of how many things people can remember, you know? And that's kind of the really uh, spring up with all the AI investment, right? And now you can see some of the very interesting investment and uh, fast forward, right? About a five years later, this one probably many people remember, right? And this is the Google uh, AlphaGo. And uh, again, defeated the uh, champions, right? Um, the South Korean's uh, gold grandmaster, Lisa Do. And uh, it's, just, it's kind of solved the long standing question. It's like, hey, the gold uh, chance, right? IBM many years ago did this uh, chance, but not a goal. Probably the holy grail of the computer games and can AI beat a human or not. 
And 2016, yes, Google showed indeed, and the AI technology, you know, now can beat the, the human in the Go uh, games. And the fast forward, even faster, right? And what is the recent AI event you remember? Anyone? Yeah, chat GPT, I can see. <laughs> now I guess everyone knows chat GPT, right? Like exactly, you know, only a few months ago, right? When OpenAI launched the chat GPT, and that, Again, right, this thing, people are going, oh, this is revolutionary technology, right? And even Bill Gates, so many other people, so excited about it, right? And the Bill Gates even said this is the most uh, important, right? As important as the PC, internet, and mobile phones. And that will revolutionize everything. So now, now again, back to my story, you know, why I think this is uh, something like I call it crisis. And this technology, all this AI technology is so wonderful. I call it the flash AI technology, right? The one I'm seeing, the crisis the kind of person I'm seeing, I showed you, right? And it's the environmental issues, the crisis, the education, all of those things. But they are not flashing. I call it the earthly AI solutions. And this really is the, the moment of the rubber meets the road, right? In order for you to deploy your technology, to solve societally important questions. It's not only about the demo. It's not only about beating the humans in terms of the games, competitions. It's about how to use technology to solve a problem that is really meaningful for the society. And then not only technology demo, you need to make sure technology really work, right? Also consider the economic considerations and the societal challenges. And of course, if you know, I, I know the open AI have chat GPT is so supposed to be open, but it's very closed, right? You do not know, I mean, I, I can, from various news channels, you know, people's speculations, right? To train the chat GPT takes a billions, maybe dollars, you know, in order for you to train the, the chat GPT, in order to support its use, it takes millions of dollars per day. I do not know those numbers, right? Those numbers are just only kind of the people's speculation. But I know how much uh, kind of effort IBM has put in into this technology because IBM is very open, you know, they write a journal papers. So this all these numbers coming from the from the journals. But IBM published this technology, right, 2011. And because I was part of that uh, whole in that uh, organization, so I, I know how much uh, cost went into this one. In terms of hardware cost, I just showed you, right? This is, a, of course, this is a little bit older data in a sense, right? Decades, almost a decade ago already. In order to have it the was in jeopardy, um, this uh, system, right? You can see you need the high performance systems, high performance computing system to support it. And that at that time, uh, Power 7 is the best uh, servers at that time, right? It takes about 90 servers with a close to 3,000 Power 7 cores, right? Terabytes of the DRAM, terabytes of the storage in order to do that competition, do the computation in order to, to, uh, to beat the two champions. And think of how many people can afford such a kind of solutions. In, this is only the hardware cost. How about the software development cost, right? For those hardware development costs, I know I've at least put more than 30 engineers, the best of the best engineers, research scientists, working for more than five years, right? Huge investment for IBM in order to develop such a, a solution. And that solution is only one time to show up, we can do it, right? But then you look at how many years take IBM in order to try to commercialize to solve the real problems. And there's many up and downs. I'm not going to the detail, just showing you the cost, right? The reason for this high cost because of the software system it's not uh, easy. It's very complicated, right? I show you this to solve the systems. They consist of many, many different uh, models, different AI components. And this extensive collection of the technologies need to be put it together, right? You need to evaluate which model to use and for what purpose and how to interact. That's why it takes so many good engineers, research scientists, to develop such a software systems to deliver the solution. So now this is kind of a, 
the personal contrast I can see, right? On the one hand, from the society, you see there's many, many earthly needs for our society to solve various kinds of the crisis, right? Challenges. On the other hand, to develop AI technologies, you need so much of investment, right? And from both the hardware, the software, okay? In order to develop a solutions, and that solution typically is the very flashy demonstration systems, but how do you really bridge this gap from the fresh AI to the earthly AI solutions? And how can we make the AI technology to make a difference to people's life at a scalable fashion, meaning lower cost, right? Widely accessible and easily to address different kinds of challenges. I think that's the greatest challenges for the AI. And that really brought me okay, to this okay, uh, about uh, four years ago now. And I, I gave this talk as a TEDx talk at the Illinois and about this contrast between the flash AI and the earthly AI. And uh, so I gave a link here and feel free to check out later you know, for some of the other projects I, 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 I did, okay? To basically kind of so addressing similar kind of uh, concerns I had. And uh, now back to this okay, uh, National AI Institute. So that's about, the, like about the, when well, a year ago, right? When this NSF had this couple of proposal and I'm starting to write the proposals and that's really kind of the background. Okay, why I'm picking this topic, right? And uh, so because the NSF listed okay, the topic means that okay, you want to develop AI technology to help children with disabilities. The which group, how? That's really the question driving my thinking behind it, you know, when I write the proposal. And really the question is really, I think, in where the earthly AI technology can make a biggest impact. So I did some studies myself, and of course, talking to many other people too. And actually, I, I even reached out to some of faculty members at the IIT as well, because IIT is known for this, uh, people with the hearing, the hard, hard of hearing kind of uh, populations. And so I talked to some faculty members here. I even write a write papers on that topic, how AI can help people with the, with the hearing kind of uh, disabilities as well. But the, when I started to dig into this uh, problem, right, and, uh, and knowing this particular um, population, and I look at the broader sense, you know, actually I realized in the US, in order for people to be qualified, for the people with the special education needs, you need to be falling into this 13 categories on the left-hand side. These are the 13 categories by the US Department of Education, right? So of course, the hearing impairments, for example, right, is, a, is a one of the categories, but it's less than 1% of the US population. This is a 20, 21 numbers, okay? And uh, there's other 13 categories that are sorted by, by the, um, in terms of populations, and it's a, the dark orange means it's uh, kind of the children in the public school systems, and which means in, from the K to 12, right? And the lighter yellow is the people with the, in the, uh, to the daycare, you know, the three to five kind of uh, age group. And as you can see, if I'm only helping a particular type of group of people, people say, hey, what, are you helping the autism or not? Right? Are you helping this uh, hearing of uh, the people with a hearing impairment or not? It's only help a small of whatever percentage of people. Then I talking to many, many more people, I realized one thing actually, no matter which category you're coming from, one of the services they require to, to, to receive in the school system is the speech and the language related services, no matter which category you're coming from, right? And of course, I did some of the back of the envelope of computation by reading the articles as well. And I just say, hey, do some simple computation, you know, maybe 80% of the children, right, with a specific learning disabilities, that's kind of one of the categories. They need is a speech and language related services. Speech and language impairments, right? And uh, the different categories, you can, there's a lot of the research paper to see, you know, which category of the pay, uh, children requires certain kind of services. Once you do the kind of back of the envelope of computation, quickly you'll realize in the US, at the least, Okay, almost half of the children receive the special education services. They need a, spe uh, a speech and language pathologist to help to improve their speech and languages. 
So the numbers 2021, right? And that was I saw from the Department of Education is about the 6.8 million in the public school systems, children receive the services. Divided by half is 3.4 million. And this year's number I saw is 7.2 million. Divided by two is about 6.6, 3.6 million, at least. Okay, this is kind of a back of envelope computation. So which means if I can develop some technologies to help speech and language related issues, I can impact at least this many of the children's lives. So that's why I picked this topic. And why? And by talking to more people, you realize, right? In the US, if you have 3.4 million at least, right, the children require the services, speech and language services. Do you know how many people work in this space in the public system? It's a 61,000 speech and language pathologist. If you do a computation, the number of uh, children, right, versus the number of uh, minutes of this SLP can provide, assuming they work eight hours without nonstop, right, and uh, five days a week, and uh, think of how many minutes each child can receive this education from the specialist. It's less than 30 minutes a week. That's why in the school systems, there's a huge challenges, not to mention a lot of school systems, right? Dep that's also, it's on average, some of school systems may be better. Some school systems actually is probably you don't have enough uh, if the, 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 the SLPs at all. And so the huge challenges is okay, the, called the caseload, which means that for each SLP, speech language pathologist, how many children you need to see on a daily basis called the caseload. The caseload is just tremendously uh, heavy, right? And that causes a lot of uh, problems to the school system. So let me, for people who didn't know how the system works, this, I'm using this cartoon to show you how the system works, okay, roughly, right? And uh, typically through this a three process, okay, at least. So first you have some children at home, right? Attending the schools or attending the daycares, whatever. It up, it's really up to the, the parents or the care, caregivers or the teachers noticed your child may have some issues, right? And then you bring the child to see a doctor or to see uh, some uh, schools, a kind of a special education service board, right? So the first step, the notice, is means the screening through the ad hoc referral, right? By the parents or the, or the teachers. So then once you get a referred, then you do the assessment, right? Or the evaluation, formal evaluation, and then determines eligibilities. And then you are qualified. Once you are qualified to receive the service from the school systems, then you will be assigned the help, okay? Once you get assigned the help, they will develop what they call the IEP, right? Individual educational program for each child, you know, based on your assessment with diagnosis, what kind of, education help you need, right? What are the targets? Then you go to the school systems, you know, be it in the daycare, in the town, in the local community, or through the public school systems. Then you will receive the services. And, uh, and then the, because of the, in the school systems, it, there's not enough SLPs or special education teachers, typically in the school system, right? You receive called group-based interventions which means you're a group of a child seeing the same SLP, right? And uh, of course, every child's need is different, but the SLP try their best to help each individual uh, child. So the issue is, you know, this ad hoc referral because of children, parents, the teachers, right? the regular teachers are not specialists. So they may be missing signs of the issues of the old children, right? So which means a lot of the children actually get a misidentified or identified late in the, in the, in the learning process, so which means they missed the best opportunity to be uh, to receive the interventions. And also for the children who receive the intervention in the school system because of the larger caseload, they only get a not optimal, right? Because it cannot be customized, the solutions. And this is kind of the challenges that we are facing in our school system. And uh, to make this a little bit more personal, 
this is a story, the true story, okay? And there's a fake picture and the name is a fake, okay, for the privacy concerns. This is coming from uh, one of the SLPs and the, in, in her clinical practice and the, the story and she told me. Actually, this is one of the, like a, let's say called it Talia, right? Talia is 18 years old. She's already in the community college. And then she's starting to realize one thing, you know, of course, maybe not only realize, like probably she's starting to, because she becomes an adult, so she can make a decision on her own now. She started to feel like something got, got to be wrong with myself because of, I have a hard time to learn, you know, and how to memorize the things and have some language issues. And now she's seeing the doc, doctors herself. And then through her story, actually, she told her again, that she was diagnostic, she had the speech and language issues. But the trouble, she said, you know, when, since when she was young, because of her, her grades, right, looks uh, typical, and uh, no one realized actually she, she, she needed some special education, right? Her parents, her teachers, no one. And uh, so this is something like, uh, as you can see, 18 years of old, she missed the best time for interventions, right? So now she's in a totally different uh, life trajectory. Now she realized she needed the help. And this is not a typical only for one person. And we also talked to some of the experts in this field, right? And uh, the first one said, right, the, and Dr. Hartley and Michael Andrew, and she said, right, birth to five years present the best opportunities for children to receive the intervention if you're able to identify, right, in terms of the speech and language uh, development. But however, in, in, our, in our school system, right now, many children are missed or referred to receive it sort of too late, right? And uh, the second one, you know, this is the Asha, is one of the speech language kind of organization and uh, the president. And she said, even if you are seeing a specialist, right? And the specialist is telling you like 69% of the parents actually misses the signs and of the early warnings of the children who needed this, this kind of the, uh, interventions. And not to mention, in the US, there's 20 million of children actually do not even have access to the, to the pediatric care. So even, not to mention like the parents, right? So even not many, actually 20 million children actually do not even see the early uh, pediatric doctors. So which means there's a possibility you can even miss the, uh, the early signs even, uh, even worse for those kind of populations, okay? So this shows you the importance of uh, the early detection, okay, early screening. And the second about the about the intervention. In the intervention, yes, the, the problem actually, even though the SLPs get especially uh, trained, right? So they know the subject very well, but it's a complexity they have to deal with is huge, right? And uh, think of every child had his own IEP targets, learning goals, okay? Every child, because the situation is different, right? I just keep some examples. And now for each type of uh, Learning goals, targets. If you look at the literature, there's a different kinds of uh, intervention method. And one of the methods they would like to use is called evidence-based intervention, right? Which means it need to be scientifically supported. But this intervention method is huge from the literature point of view, right? There's so many methods. That's why whenever you see a doctor, actually SLPs, probably depending on where you are, right? Which region you are, and what is the SLPs training or experience, you may receive different kind of interventions. And in order for that SLP to be effective, they also have a different method, right? Stimulus method, elicitation techniques as well. All of this is kind of multiplied together. You can see the, the solution space is huge. And for doctor SLPs, under this high case law, with a limited amount of time, less than 30 minutes to meet one child on a weekly basis, you think of how this solution can be optimal for every single child. Right? So that means there's huge challenges. So this is why I call it, this is really uh, causes a vicious cycles of the current practice. Vicious cycles for both the screening and the intervention. What do I mean by this one? Because of the shortage of SLPs. For the screening, we only rely on the ad hoc referrals from the parents, from the caregivers. As I mentioned, this is what means that a child will be identified late or misidentified. So which means when they go to the school systems, they miss the best time for intervening. 
they require much more help, support on the system. So you further stress the systems in terms of the shortage of the SLPs, right? Another side, on the other side of the intervention, because of the intervention, you know, you go to the school systems, because the lack of the SLPs, the SLP can only provide to group-based intervention, which means you cannot provide individualized or customized interventions. The solution to each individual child is not the best, right? So which means they need the, the result in the poor performance, academic performance. So as they progress into the systems, later on, it requires even more support as well. So this is kind of really the two vicious cycles for both the screening and the intervention. That really inspired us, you know, what is our proposals? What is our solutions to address these two challenges? So our solutions is to, let's develop as AI technologies, earthly AI technologies, I call the AI screener. Use the AI technology to enable the universal screening so we can identify children who are in need of those services early, right? And the sooner, better. So this is called the AI screener. The second one is, you know, for the intervention. For the children who has already been in the system, recruited past the services, can we use the AI, we call the AI orchestrator, that can help with the SLPs or the teachers to monitor in the children's progress and provide the individualized uh, dashboard recommendations to help with the SLPs to provide the quality interventions. So these are the two solutions we proposed in, to, to, to develop through this institute. So this really tried to advance this user-inspired artificial intelligence, right, the AI technologies, to scale the availability of SLPs. So we can enable the universal screening and to provide individualized or ability-based uh, interventions. So this is kind of the grand vision for our institute. Okay. So hopefully through this process, right? And of course, this is an NSF proposal. We have to also advance the foundational science as well. So what are the foundational science we are advancing, right? So that's when we talk to the learning science people, right? And the specialists understand, you know, what are the fun, kind of the fundamental learning science questions they want to solve. Now with the AI, we can provide more insights so it's for them to explore the foundational science questions. And then also develop advanced science, AI science technology as well. Okay, so we can advance AI and together we can design the solution and with the human facing aspect as well. So we're also involving the human centered uh, kind of researchers to develop technology that is human facing, right? And then we can implement our solutions and we can deploy our solutions. We can collect the data to further push our understanding of the learning science, et cetera. So by doing this way, you know, we think we really created the virtuous cycles of our institute research. And uh, through over the times, so hopefully we can really to help the children to improve the final academic uh, performance in terms of speech and languages. Okay. So this is kind of shows you that our vision. I'm giving you a very quick high level, you know, what are the components involved and which we think we need to develop to enable the AI screener and the AI orchestrator, right? So the AI solutions will be in the attribute based solutions that are deployed for example, for the screening. We try to focus on the early detection. So our AI screener will be deployed in a classroom setting, okay? And I can tell you why we pick the classroom settings as well. And for the early screening, you know, of course, you want it to be as early as possible, right? Maybe even since the children is born. But that involves your AI technology need to be deployed at the home. And just out of the privacy, extremely cautious, right? For the privacy concerns. And because now you need some technology to monitor you, it will feel, right? So then we kind of scale back, say, hey, not, not to go to the home, maybe study at the in, in the daycare center, you know, at least in a public school, it's kind of a setting, more or less. So we focus on the children in the three to five years old in the early childhood classrooms. The technologies can be deployed, right? Can interact with the children, okay? In different kind of settings. So we can record in the videos or the audio signals. And this video audio signals will be going through different AI 
pipelines or the technologies, right? Involving the automatic speech recognitions, the video understanding, multimodality com comprehension, and uh, and of course, make sure it's a human uh, facing. And uh, the solution need to be deployed on the edge. So that I mean, we do not take the solutions to the cloud so people can, can access and uh, to remove some of the uh, parents' uh, the concerns. And uh, the solution need to be deployed in some kind of AI environment, right? Be the robotics or be the app or be just only the camera or whatever. So what is the best form to deliver the solutions? And uh, we will use the AI to analyze this information into the video and audios to understand what are the critical kind of signals, right? Called the uh, uh, metrics, the current SLP use with the current SLPs to intervene to, for them to do the diagnosis. What are the signals they try to they try to detect? Can we do similar calculations? This is really trying for us to validate our technology, right? And then we can also advance the science. Maybe some of the metrics can be further improved. Maybe the current practice is not optimal enough. For example, one of our team members thinking, you know, the automaticity is a better metric to detect the children's speech language issues. But the automaticity right now is very difficult for typical SLPs to do the calculation because it takes time, and which I'll show you example later. Hopefully through the AI, we can calculate those uh, new novel metrics, signals, right? And also we can extract some of the critical moments. So instead of ask doctors to review hundreds of hours of the videos, audios, you can show that this is the moments we think is problematic. Can you please review or not, right? To, the, to scale the SLPs kind of at the time. And we can generate the reports to, for the parents to, for the parents right, to review, the teachers to review, only at the permission of the parents and the teachers, they can decide because we're not going to decide it for the parents and teachers. They can decide, hey, this children, should I bring to the to see the uh, the specialist? Okay. And then you go through the typical process, right? The diagnosis and the uh, eligibility determination, et cetera. And this, through this process, we can do the validation of our technology. And also we can deploy our technologies as well. So this kind of shows you the high level work streams we have got to be in place in order for us to develop this AI screener solutions, right? And uh, similarly, you know, and once we have the solutions, we can deploy the solutions at the, in the classrooms, okay? And this is kind of a cartoonish kind of, a, hey, if we, the solution can be deployed in the classrooms, we can observe every single child's interactions with other child or with or by themselves or with the teachers. And then we can produce this customized dashboard, right? And each child, what the kind of, what the vocabulary uh, this child has been saying, what kind of issues they, they could potentially could have, okay? So really it's AI screener to enable the early and the frequent universal screening, okay? And uh, another to kind of show, to kind of similarly to show the AI orchestrator. So AI orchestrator uh, for people who, who may not kind of uh, know the system very well, right? I try to make an analogy here. So you can think of the AI orchestrator, right? It's not the intervention itself, it's about the uh, uh, things behind, the, behind this intervention. So what do I mean by this one? So think about it, um, Netflix, right? So Netflix holds a bunch of the movies, right? Made by many other production companies. And uh, you have many people watching the movies. The Netflix decides what movie to recommend you to read, right? To watch based on your past watching histories, your, your, your feedbacks. Similar thing here, you know, there's so many intervention methods. There's so many SLPs, the practice is different. So how do we recommend the right intervention for the SLPs to do? And this is an AI oxygen at a high level. It's really the recommendations. And of course, like a Netflix, right? Once you understand the people's uh, viewing behaviors, what, what kind of movies is that will be viewed by most people, the Netflix have to make it their own movies. And of course, by our uh, similar analogy, we can also have our own interventions, maybe better interventions, right? But this one has to be kind of put in this kind of context. So our solution will be similar to the AI screener, but a little bit for, uh, more expanded, meaning we also will take the audio video streams for the, for the, uh, from the children interacting with different intervention methods, but also observing the intervention results, 
all this data going through different kinds of the AI components in terms of calculating your conventional SLP, so teachers uh, uh, kind of uh, track measures or the signals. And then you can calculate some novel uh, metrics. And then you do this uh, kind of generate your reports. And based on this information, you can fit into your reinforcement uh, learning agent and you can make the recommendations. This is kind of a uh, forward, right? So to kind of show you, once we have the solutions, we can make our uh, customized recommendations for every single child based on their individualized need. So that's kind of our high level uh, solution components, right? And what it looks like. And uh, in the remaining about the eight minutes, okay? And I'm going to give you a little bit of the case of the research challenges. It is many, many research challenges. I'm going to show you very simple ones kind of to, to illustrate, right? And we will try to develop, but first again, there's so many researchers, everyone work on different components and how I going to put them together to work together in a cohesive way, right? So um, again, I'm taking a lesson I learned from IBM's approach, with the, which developed this like Watson technology, right? So instead of only focus on individual AI technologies, only evaluate individual AI components performance based on the different set of the data set, what we we want to do is to build the AI solutions early on. So this is kind of the early days of the IBM Watson, right? Very early on, you develop your solutions for the baseline. The solution uses existing AI components, okay? Or whatever the AI components you think you can find and to see how the solution will look like end to end, right? And if you, in the early days, can, the performance can be very bad. That's okay when you know where's your baseline. Now you can start to improve your solutions by taking out some of the components. You put your components in, right? Whoever is owning the components in terms of speech recognition or in terms of the or language understanding, you put your components in, you gradually improve your solutions, right? Until you are able to achieve the, the quality of the results that you design. And uh, so we, we will use this similar kind of approach in our institute as well, which is different from typical kind of uh, academic research. So we want to build the solutions early on, even though it is not uh, perfect. And then we gradually improve our solutions with people's contributions. So this is an approach we're going to take we call a solution-based metric guided research. Okay. So given the examples here, uh, the, the, in terms of research challenges, right? And here I'm showing you some of the papers, you know, and uh, two of them actually coming from uh, my colleagues at the, the UB and um, at the first author, Hugo Guo, right? And the first two papers shows you a specific metrics. And for his research, what the kind of metrics you need to compute in order for you to do screening. The third paper is for intervention. What kind of intervention in order for you to help a particular child, right, with a particular symptoms? This is only three research papers mm -hmm. out of millions of articles, right? And many of those approaches could be useful but for a particular type of a group of children, for a particular type of the research, uh, kind of the symptoms. I'm just showing you, even for this kind of very specific ones, what are kind of AI challenges involved, okay? So just kind of to summarize, this, let's use the first two papers as an example, right? It shows you what kind of metrics, signals you need to calculate. The first one is called the finite verb morphology composite. I'll call it M M -V uh, F V M C. Basically, it means okay when you speech right, and you want to calculate okay the percentage of accuracy of uh, the tense as an agreement of morphemes in obligatory context. So using your language samples, for example, like to give an example, this is an example from my colleague. Right, once there was a giraffe and an elephant, right, and they were playing with a ball by the pools. There's different sentences. And some of the sentences grammatically, right, had some mistakes. Okay, this shows you, I, can, I want to compute in your speech. And uh, this one, this case, five sentences, all of the five, three stream, seems to be correct. So that's kind of a 60%. Okay, they want to use a simple metric. Hey, if the child, right, has this uh, good numbers, which means your language is okay. If you have low numbers, your, your, your language may have some issues. This is a simple metric, okay? Another type of metric, you call the percentage of grammatical utterances. 
which means out of the utterances and how likely you're going to say that correctly or not. So in this case, you know, I have four examples, right? And uh, out of the four sentence utterances, only one is correct, three is wrong. So this is 25%. So this is kind of a metric, there's all kinds of metrics. But in order for this uh, uh, to work, right? The current SLPs has to do, to do this manually, okay? And that's why a lot of SLPs cannot afford to do this kind of language uh, sample analysis because it takes time. And even though you have already have some software, right? You may think of this other software called, called the salt, sugar, right? Clam. These are some of the very popular software the current SLPs use. But if you look at the details, all of this software they use underlying is a transcription, meaning take the recordings or someone has to, to write it down, the recording, what is, what's happening in this recording. And then based on the recordings, based on the annotations, then you do the computations to compute those metrics. Then you determine if this children has an issue or not. And so you, you may think, hey, transcription seems like to be a solved problem, right? The ASR you know, has been around for so many years. In fact, if you talk to the people you know, transcription is most, is kind of the bottleneck. Okay, and uh, so just give illustration here. For example, this is uh, one of the transcription. Okay, let's assume it, this is almost perfect transcription, right? I'm showing you this, this is the perfect transcription. Can anyone tell me what, what this means? This is let's say, a perfect transcription from, from one child, right? That kind of uh, set, a, set, a, set a, this kind of thing here. Probably takes quite a while for you to figure out what, what, what's happening here, right? But SLP is actually they're looking for the really one of the signals they're looking for really out of those sentences, there's really two more or less meaningful utterance, right? The elephant the starts doing with his chunk and he's making lots of noise. Because all of those two utterance, I can compute the metrics I just mentioned. Okay, you can realize, oh, the two utterance, both utterance have some grammatical issues. Then I can I can realize, okay, to compute the metric in order for me to do the screen. But this one, even you have a perfect transcription, ASR, in order for the SLP to do the work, there's still a gap, right? There's still additional kind of uh, human efforts need to be involved. Not to mention, if you think of the real transcription, which is even messier than what I just showed you. This is another example. If you take one of the data set, I have a link here. This is a data set about uh, one adult and one child have a conversation at home. You take this data, you put it into the current state of the art automatic speech recognition systems. And the left shows the transcription from the software. On the right, it shows the real human transcriptions and shows the, the gaps here, right? The, the, the yellow one shows you the miss, kind of this misalignment, right? And this shows you, in terms of one of the metrics, the word error rate, this is a, still another very perfect uh, metric. But you can see even the current AI, AI technology can only do uh, 0.69. For this particular example, this is also actually, actually a very simple example. If it's for some more uh, challenging examples, this number will be much lower, okay? And, and I, we also evaluate this technology for across different uh, AI technologies. You know, the CALDI is one, the open AI is called the Whisper, is even worse, right? And there's other technologies too. So you can see the current AI technologies actually does not work well for children's speeches, okay? So this is kind of quickly to show you, right? This is only one example of challenges. In order to solve this challenge, we, that's why we, how we put all the peoples together, right? So we have so many researchers working on different aspects from the foundational AI to the multimodality uh, perceptions, and the human centered AI designs, and also with the domain experts, we have to work together to solve this challenge. Okay. So, to me, this is kind of our vision of the institute, right? We hope we can develop our AI screener and AI orchestrator so we can help children like Italian, right? So, they can choose, they can be, their kind of need can be identified early so we can help them early. So, later on, when they go to the starting their own, uh, life, they can be in a totally different uh, uh, trajectory compared to the current uh, uh, practice. So that's our institute uh, and uh, 
that's all. Thank you.